Hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, along with my wonderful wife, Janet, and we are streaming live from the Team Needham Abode podcast studio. And we are super excited to have Dr. Grace Torres Hodges on our podcast today. She is a doctor and runs a direct care practice down in... Um, Florida. And we'll talk a little bit. We've talked a lot about direct primary care and direct care on our podcast before, but we'll have Grace discuss that a little bit more. Um, We had the opportunity of actually, I followed her for years on social media, and we actually had the opportunity to run into her at the Free Market Medical Association annual conference in Oklahoma City um, this year in April. So I was super excited about that to see her and talk about um, free markets and in, in healthcare and how they are solving a lot of problems. So, Grace, welcome to our show. Hey, thank you, thank you. Hi, Sean. Hey, Janet. How's it um, going? Greetings from across the country. Yes, that's right. And thank you for being on. And um, thank you for being a pioneer in direct care. You've been doing this for ten plus years now. Um, and now, just tell us. You know, tell our listeners and viewers, just to remind them about what direct, why is direct care different than, you know, your traditional doctor's office? So, you know, what I do is actually direct specialty care. So we'll go into that also a little bit, too. Um, what it comes down to is when physicians went into medical school, the reason why the majority of us went into medical school is because we wanted to take care of an individual, a patient in front of us. And it was always based on a one-on-one doctor-patient relationship. And for years, that's the way it's been practiced. I'm a second generation physician. So I watched my parents in what I call the heyday of medicine prior to managed care, um, that they that was what you you aspired to, and that's what you thought you were going to be doing once you got out of uh, medical school and residency and fellowship. Um, the reality of it is, and it has changed tremendously. I've been my I'm approaching my 25th year in private practice. Um, it has changed tremendously from the time that I was in residency to today. And what has happened was that there was a third party that got inserted in between. And basically, instead of a patient going to find a a doctor directly and paying a doctor directly, there was an intermediary that got in there. And that's what we call the third party. The majority of these folks have been insurance. Um, And as a result of that, it has changed a lot of the way that we do uh, medicine. It didn't start off that way. We can go through history and actually see that uh, it was actually meant to be beneficial, to assist in paying. What people have to remember is that health care and health insurance are two different things. They don't equal each other. Health care is what uh, those of us that are offering treatments to patients and doing diagnostics, on them and everything, um, that that is the treatment for health services, but health insurance is a means to pay. And unfortunately, it has taken over quite a bit. Um, when we were in school, for most physicians, we were always told, concentrate on clinical and mm-hmm. Hire somebody to do business. But the problem is the business of medicine grew around us. um, And a lot of the third party payers began to take over. And if you don't realize that that's happening in today's world when you're practicing within the traditional insurance based medicine, because I do get a lot of physicians that they can't. They, it's hard to put your mind around it, let alone patients will see that also. They, they don't quite get it. Anytime there is a prior authorization needed or a need to just have someone approve a referral, that means that your doctor's not making that decision. It is somebody else. And uh, from the patient's perspective, that is the interference that we're talking about. So when we're talking about direct care, whether it's in family medicine and internal medicine, which are a primary care specialist or specialist, actually, those of us like myself, I'm in podiatry um, and surgeons, you know, what we're talking about is, is that we're working with our patient one-on-one outside of that whole realm altogether. And that's what we call direct care. And the two terms that keep showing up are direct primary care, direct specialty care, Direct primary care has been around longer. I actually used to go to DPC conferences to learn about direct care. Um, And they have a membership 
based model, kind of almost like a Netflix kind of way of things. Specialists are a little different. We're a mixed breed because some of our uh, services, most of, in my case, is episodic. So you can't have a membership model. So it becomes a little bit different. Um, and so uh, the roundabout way, that's direct care to me. And I hope that gives uh, a good background to start from. It, it does. One thing I want you to um, address is, well, wait a minute, this direct care, people paying for health care directly, it must be really expensive. What do you got to say about that? Oh, no. If you if you actually if you're looking at in your insurance EOBs, your explanation of benefits, it is rare. Uh, maybe way, way back 20, 30 years ago, you would have a matching number for what the fee that was charged and what was actually paid mm -hmm. to whoever the provider was. Um, what has happened was is that there's a misalignment of incentives. When you're dealing with a direct care doctor, the goal is to take care of you. And we just want to make you better. So as a small business, which we have to remind private practice doctors that that's the case, um, you, you basically are just trying to make ends meet and balance balance the books of what it costs to provide the service and get the service back. When you're dealing with an insurance company, the misaligned incentive is that the insurance company wants to save money and or wants to improve their dividends later on for their shareholders. And so they are looking for either more procedures um, or mm -hmm. denying procedures to, right. to do things. Yeah. Um, as far as what is more, it's not really more expensive. It's actually a better use of your money. I, I, I'm not anti-insurance, particularly when we're talking about auto car and in certain certain health healthcare plans that actually are like reimbursement, self-insured. Um, you know, it's the, the BUCAs, we know about those, those folks they are not good stewards of the money that we put in. I mean, for 40 years, they've been saying, we'll cut, you know, if you use our insurance, prices will go down, but premiums still keep going up. Reimbursements keep going down. So something's going to And deductibles keep going up. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the, that's the threshold before they actually pay. So yeah, right. it's like, it's like the house. There was a, at, at the free market medical association, um, Dr. Marty McCary said something mm -hmm. profound. Um, the the health insurance companies, uh, these bucas, are are like the arsonist and the fireman. They're creating yes. the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Right. So I got to interject this because I grew up so rural, and our physician in our little hometown of small rural North Dakota, um, Dr. Larson wasn't. Um, beholden to an insurance company as his provider to pay him, correct? Uh -huh. And so he was um, very personal. You saw him at church. You saw him at the, the post office. You saw him down, you know, downtown. He took care of all of us when we, you know, were in sports, that kind of thing. But the, the, the dynamics have changed, right? And the care he gave is so different than what happens today. And that generation of like your parents providing care to that patient has changed, right? Uh -huh. So what happens is these doctors become beholden to an insurance company and that's who is their payer. So that's who they're caring for, right? right. Not who's in front of them. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that they chose that, but that's what's happening, right? It and it, and it, it, that's what drew me into direct care because, uh, to be honest with you, I, I was ready to give it up. I mean, when you talk about physician burnout, it is true. It's real you know, because I, I used to see, and it's forget about forget about the the money component of it right now. Right. It's just you you being able to do what you need to do to the best of your ability. You know, you want to. You, you're dealing with very, very disciplined individuals who mm -hmm. go into medicine, who have wanted to do this way of um, uh, this, this form. This is their, their profession. Many, it's a vocation, you know. It's an art. It's exactly. An art. Exactly. And there's not, we can't pigeonhole things. And when you're being told and somebody's behind you telling you how to do it, and you see the person in front of you and you can't do it for them. 
you've, you're, it, it's the perfect example is the golden handcuffs. You're stuck. Right. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, one of the things that I had a hard time with, because I grew up in my, in my parents' office, you know, and, and I, I, I decided to come back to my hometown to practice and doing that. These are people that I grew up with who took right. care of me, my teachers and friends of the family and everything like that. And it is a communal type of way of, yeah. of working with the community. I was behind all the time. I would spend time. I didn't compromise how I treated. I just didn't make as much as, you know, I didn't worry. I, I was struggling financially, you know, as a small business owner trying to make ends meet because my reimbursements weren't matching up with what it actually cost in the time to spend with each of my right. patients. Right. And, um, but also you just, you just didn't feel good because you couldn't do it. Direct care, one of the beauties of it is not only is it a win-win um, overall, the win-win is because you get a healthier doctor, you get a healthier patient base. Absolutely. Because now I'm taking care, I'm, I'm being proactive rather than reactive. That's that's a big, big plus. So. Well, don't you even get to touch your patients? I mean, this is something that's rare, right? Like I just went in for an exam and the physician actually touched me. I was amazed. I was like, this is where we were before insurance. Right. Or let's 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 put it like Keith Smith would say. Really? Uh -huh. If somebody else is dictating what is happening, then your oath that you took as a physician, as a doctor, is not being withheld, right? You you right. are not being able to practice. Uh -huh. And the sad thing about it is there's so many things that are overlooked, right? Like, how do you know if somebody's thyroid is inflamed? Or how do you know if you can't do the exam? If people are throwing, you know, in this crazy thing that, you know, check the box, check all the boxes before you're paid, and you haven't even done an exam on the person. I mean, to me, it's like this whole art of practicing has been, you know, kicked out because this is, this is it's not this lost is, yet. We're trying to no, say, no, no. That's right. but, but my point is it, it, where I'm going with this is the art of being a physician has centuries behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the faith of a patient and, and doctor, that relationship has to be there for healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, physicians are patients too. You know, exactly. I see my doctor. I have a DPC doctor now, but you know, it, it, you 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 feel for your colleagues. You know, yeah. when you see them, um, one of the things that you you brought about um, was was the fact that the the way that medicine and even the exam is performed these days. I work with the residents also, and one of the things, fortunately, in podiatry, we have to touch. You know, it's actually a hands on thing, which made it actually very difficult to do EMR because I cannot do my I cannot do my note while I'm seeing the patient. You right. know what I mean? Right. You can't you know, check a the box on the yeah. screen. Because you're, right. yeah. you're doing a physical exam. Yeah. yeah. And, and you have to do, you have to manipulate, but, you know, I'm not going to unglove and glove each time. Right. Um, one of the beauties about direct care, I'm not beholden to a computer screen. And I can, I went back to old paper charts, which then I scan into my, into a system. But what, um, when I work with residents, what I always tell them, you know, they're, they're, they're quick to tell me about um, the labs and it's everything's on paper and yep. the checklist of the template for the EMR, uh, the electronic medical record that you have to complete in order to get the right ticks in order to get the billing correct so that the CPT code is covered properly. Get You want to get rid of all that because then you're not using the head, your head, the way that it was designed to. Yeah. And the exam starts from the time you lay your hands, not lay your eyes rather, on the individual. So when I come, patient comes in, I greet them at the door. I'm watching them as they get up from their seat, as they walk in, because that's important to me, because as a podiatrist, I need to see how they're walking. They walk, I look yeah. at their demeanor, how they're talking to me, you know, their swagger or lack of, you know, as they sit down, even just, just how they appear, how, how well kept they are. You know, I have chance to talk to the, to the caregiver, the parent or the spouse in the room, but it, it is 
it is a full picture that you need to be able to get. And you cannot do that in seven minutes when you're just coming in and out, in and out, in and out with everything. And you can't no. rely on your assistants to do that because the buck stops with you. And well, yeah. here's, here's something very interesting that was very validated for me with my last experience was we also have intuition, like, right. Like as a parent, I knew there was something wrong, right? Like, like my oldest son was ill and there was something not, and I was, you know, Oh, it's just fine. It's this, it's this, it's that. But as a mother, I'm like instinctively going, no, exactly. like there's like, right. Well, if we were practicing that way, right. Like how you're describing, you would sense that mother is saying, <gasps> or that spouse is saying, this is not right. There's, I mean, there's times even with my husband when, you know, things are not right. I'm like, you know, right? Like, because you're paying attention. So you're going to be able to see that mm -hmm. when you observe those things, like how's that patient coming in? How's their family responding? If you're not listening to that and you're just charting. And, and it's not just the observation, it's the listening. Correct. Patients will tell you what's wrong with them. Right. You know, just listen to them because they know their body better than you do. I right. mean, you're the goal. My mom, my mom's favorite phrase to me, I remember because I used to get all upset because you think I want you to finish med school. I am the authority of this. I should know how to do this. <laughs> you know, yeah. Listen to me. Um, but she goes and says, no, your goal there is to guide them. You know, ultimately, right. the patient has the choice. They have to choose whether to take your advice or not. That's really what it comes down to. And I think we forget that when you're so bogged down with having to complete tasks that you forget ultimately it is the patient's choice as to whether or not they're going to listen to you. But if you don't have that chance to offer it or listen to them as to what's going on, we're going to miss it. So, right. Or they're not going to take value to what you have to offer mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. there's many times where it's just like... But if they listen to you, then we value your um, your expertise and worth. And that's what I tell mm -hmm. doctors a lot of times. Know your worth. Your worth yes. is the skill set that you have and the mm -hmm. knowledge of being able to synthesize it. Um, but a lot of doctors are beginning to, to lose sight of that because they're bogged down by tasks again. Mm -hmm. um, by it. And so one of the reasons why I, I, I talk about uh, managing a practice, like managing a body, because if you can manage multiple systems in the body, you know how to do project management. And right. you can, if you know how to balance ins and outs when it comes to fluids, you understand you know, finance because you have to have revenue and expenses. So you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of doubting on the fact that Oh, I'm a doctor. I've been told, I've been told I can't do this. I've been told mm. I've had to hire somebody to do this. And yeah, you want to hire someone so you can concentrate and be effective with what your skill set is, but you need to be able to monitor what's going on also. So, um, well, and I, I think that's the system does that by design to, exactly. to doctors and to pharmacists. pharmacists I can see also, that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they, they don't yeah. want pharmacists to be business people no. and it's by design so uh -huh. they can control pharmacists they can control doctors the insurance right. company can the hospital can that hires you right. um you know whatever that is and, and and not know their worth their true worth and i always feel bad when i hear a colleague will say you know i can't manage anymore my private practice and mm -hmm. they say you know the hospital is going to buy me out i've got a private equity group and it may sound good, but it, because it's a it's a weight lifted, you get a salary, but it's another layer of bureaucracy. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And patients, I, and patients are, are we have smart patients. You feel it. You know that that's happening also. So and and talking and backing up on physician burnout, um, mm -hmm. kind of the topic of our um, presentation today is, you know how physicians can gain back their autonomy. We've already mm -hmm. talked about that with direct care for one. Right. right. Um, but a lot of people don't realize, and some people that are outsiders in healthcare, they think, oh, well, physicians make, you know, all this money, which physicians are probably one of the most well-paid professions around. Mm -hmm. And um, yet most physicians are not happy because mm -hmm. the number one reason for being happy in a job 
whether you're working, digging ditches, flipping burgers at McDonald's, or doing brain surgery, is that you have autonomy over your job and your life. Right, right. Can you control your schedule? Can you control... um, you know, can you control who's making appointments? Can you control what prescriptions are covered that you write? Can you control what surgeries you do? Or does somebody else control them for you? Right. And a lot of times the physician doesn't control what kind of surgery they do or what kind of prescription they write. Right, right. The, the, the insurance company does. And a lot of people do not realize that. Well, even not not just the insurance company, but if there's a private equity or a corporation, yeah. they're going to be looking at bottom line numbers. What brings us the most amount of revenue for this? You know, And that, again, it's that misaligned incentive. That is the wrong incentive. You want the person that's taking care of you, whether it's whether it's a carpenter that's working on your house, whether it's a mechanic working on your car, whether it's right. a doctor working on you, you yep. want them to be focused on you. So, right. so we need to take business people and, and we need to have a skill set, but we need to take the MBA out of the practice of the art of medicine and let the doctor be in charge again. And right. the thing that you feel, and, and I've, Sean and I both have been patients of both sides. Mm -hmm. And the thing that happens is that when you are listened to as a consumer, as a patient, or the doctor is actually happy about what they're doing and excited and still it, it, it's that, that communication factor is totally different. I mean, that whole relationship is different, right? Yeah, it's relations. Dan uh, Dan Paul uh, talks about it all the time when he yeah. writes. Um, but it's relationship medicine, um, and and ultimately it is that doctor patient relationship. It's, it's all about communication and maintaining that communication clearly, directly. Um, it's respectful, you know. And if you if you want to mm-hmm. get into more, you know, when you think about it, free will and autonomy. That, that is very um, that is very innate. That's our inalienable right. Um, you know, we right. want to be able to keep keep that, and it does make you when you're as the physician. The, there's that phrase: um, first, do no harm. But right. how can how can doctors truly first do no harm if they are harming themselves? So you you have right. to be able to to understand where you sit, where you are, and then be able to give. Because um, another another one, I love these the analogies, but um, an empty an empty vase has nothing left to pour, you know. When uh, or an empty pitcher has nothing left to pour if you if you drain it all, and um, that's what hap- what's happening. But th- I've seen just in the last ten years, what's exciting is where we're at right now, because right. we're really seeing this emergence of of people, not just the caregivers, but our patients. They get mm-hmm. it. You know, my best ambassadors in direct care are my patients. And um, yes, because there's no better marketing there because it's just pure. And Mm -hmm. um, and and, you know, having a healthier patient base um, makes it makes it clearer. You know, transparency and honesty in pricing is is so much more it's so much more pure. Um, And we were talking about earlier about um, the costs of, of care could be so high. One of the downsides of the insurance regulations is that it's a set price and there's no room for a physician to be autonomous, to give a break. Right. <laughs> right? In, fact, in fact, you can get so in trouble. You get law. <laughs> yeah. You can right. get in trouble if you do. Yeah. You know, right. and so the fact that I can choose to do, a bundled price for a surgery like I did this morning or a payment plan for a patient or barter. You know, I live exactly. in a rural community. I get eggs. I'm happy yeah. when I get eggs, especially these days, you know, because, because, you know, it, that's the way you work in your community. But so. that's tradition and that's history, right? I mean, right. Exactly. Think about it. historically, we have only inserted insurance for how long? Oh, 40, 45 years. Yeah. So, so you know. history puts us back to where, you know, do no harm. And uh-huh. that also means, like Keith Smith says from the Oklahoma Surgical Center, that uh-huh. includes financially. Yeah, absolutely. That, that includes all of it. That's do no harm to your patient. 
wherever that lies in their life. Right. And ethically, when we are bankrupting people for care, the number one, the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States is due to health care expenses by those who have insurance. Over 50% right. of the people <laughs> that file bankruptcy on health care expenses are insured. Exactly. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. That, that makes that, if that doesn't hit home to somebody, exactly. you're missing something here. So, right. Yeah. So, Grace, tell us about your book, uh, Private Practice Solution. Here it is um, on Amazon. And I think you originally wrote it to towards physicians, um, but you're getting out there in a lot more than just physicians. Lay people are reading it, too. Tell us why. Yeah, I, you know, so the book came about as a result of when I switched into direct care. I had a lot of my friends and uh, other specialists because – direct specialty care wasn't a thing yet. The term, uh, you know, credited over to Dr. Diana Granita and, and Laura uh, Brisnew, uh Kenny about putting that, that term together. So DSC is a thing these days, but no one knew how to do it. And so it's not like I had a, a key or a template to work from, but I kept on repeating a lot of the same steps and that's where the book originally actually came came about. I'm just it's a, a compilation of how I did and how I looked at my practice, having been in practice already 15 years prior to switching. I had a, a track record of, of success in in just regular business. Forget about the insurance component, but just the regular of running a, an office and private practice. Um, but what's interesting is to go back and I love, like you said, Janet, history repeats itself and history is telling us stuff. I think. What was this target was originally for physicians mm -hmm. and also to residents and medical students, because if we don't hit them, then I didn't learn any of this when I was in in school, but it was really those were the two target audiences. And I've been blessed. I actually uh, the book received the Independent Press Award for 2024 mm -hmm. in medicine nonfiction um, and uh, which is weird for me to, to still realize, because that means non, non physicians have been reading this. Right. Um, right. And I, have, yeah. And I've had the best um, feedback from non physicians because I have a whole section in there about history, about the history of insurance and how we got tangled into the web of, of the way that we do things right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when you realize it, there's, there's a, another phrase that's great by Pavlov, um, if you want to learn a new idea, read an old book. <laughs> right? This is an old book. <laughs> you know, the way that we're doing medicine, it's there's a reason why it's been practiced a certain way for such a long time. And um, so the book, um, Private Practice Solution, I, I wrote it for physicians. I wrote it like a soap note. Um, so it's in four sections. The first section goes over the history. So it's the history of your sick patient, which is your private practice. And then the objective findings are looking at all your numbers. Um, the assessment is deciding, okay, where do you want to go? Do you want to stick with what you're doing right now? Or do you want to move on to something different? And then the, the plan at the end is the treatment. It's like, this is how you create a direct care practice. And so um, I was very deliberate in the way that I did. And it, I think it just came out of naturally, that's the way I think, because that's how we do it in medicine. So um, I've been blessed. I'm very grateful for it. That's and I awesome. hope it's been, it's reaching out. Obviously it is. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. That's, that's awesome. awesome. So, so this was perfect timing on this podcast because you have an article coming out on KevinMD.com and anybody in medicine that is interested in free markets, I, I suggest you follow KevinMD.com. He's on LinkedIn also. You can follow him there. Um, Tell us about this article that's coming out tomorrow on um, his uh, social media. Yeah, so I um, the funny thing, I have my MBA. I got it after I went into direct care because I had time to go back to school yeah. and, and learn it. And it's not like I, you know, I when I was trying to teach other doctors on how to um, – transition out of insurance-based medicine into direct care, there was this, this doubt that they couldn't do business. 
because we were told we couldn't do business. Yep. Um, and I said, come on, you, you, you can, if you could learn the Krebs cycle and you can manage, right. yeah. oh my goodness. <laughs> body, you can do, right. you can do business anyway. So I, I, I had always been inkling to go back to school to, to actually get a, get an MBA because also there's a credibility in talking to other people about direct care. It's like, you're a doctor. You don't know anything about business. Well, having, I hate to say it, the little acronym at the end opens a couple of doors here and there. Yeah. But I um, got, went through an uh, MBA program. And um, what ended up happening was as I was going through the different um, the courses in there of accounting and finance and operations management and, and um, you know, leadership and entrepreneurship and there's a relationship. We, we do all of those things in medicine already, and we've been exposed to it at some point in time. I, I alluded to finance and, and ins and outs when it comes to homeostasis and balance. Um, you know, if you're talking about uh, organization management, every resident knows this because you knew from chief resident all the way down to medical student how to manage a group of, of, right. of doctors and leadership. You know, um, entrepreneurship doctors have to remember how you got into medical school and how you had to market yourself to the med schools to get in there and how you, you know, fulfilled your undergrad years of, of things. And so um, accounting should be a piece of cake because we're detail oriented and we're numbers oriented. And it's a matter of just looking at data and being able to relate it. So what I did was I tried to use the terms of the different subjects in business school and put it with relation to what we're already what's in our wheelhouse already. And that's where the, the article came about. Um, and so hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll hit home to, to some people and, and make you realize that we, you know, particularly ducks, we know what we're doing and you have it in you, but it's a choice, you know, it, again, this is free will and this is choice yeah. and autonomy. There are doctors that are not, they don't, the entrepreneur bug is not in them. I get it. You know, I, I had it in me, but there are some doctors that just wanted to go in and, 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 you know, be told how to do a certain thing. And we, you know, every, every practice, every business needs leaders and we need people that are willing to, to do some of the, the work to help the entire thing grow. You know, it's not in, they're not in it for themselves. It's to make everything else better. So. Well, what comes to mind to me is. It used to be that physicians really helped even run hospitals, right? Uh -huh. Like uh -huh. manage that. Right. And so those that had the skill set worked for that and did that. Right. And so we just need to pull that back in and, Absolutely. and be comfortable with, you know, you're right. There are some people that don't want that, but there are some that are truly meant to, to lead uh -huh. and, um, we just need to inspire the leaders to get back in their roles and be confident in themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's just doctors and it hasn't been that long ago, as you know, you've been in practice 25 years. And I think, I think that's when we started seeing a change about 25 years ago right? where, you know, 25 years ago, doctors used to be in charge of the healthcare yeah. system. I mean, Hospital administrators would bow to doctors, right? And, 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 and as well as they should, doctors should control health care. Uh -huh. um, you know, I mean, and, and that's just the bottom line is doctors need to take charge of, of health care again. A, a big thing that maybe a lot of listeners, those that are not in, in health care or uh, who aren't physicians, don't realize when we talk about residency programs, and I want to bring this up because this was a huge eye-opening thing when I, when it came, when I realized it, since I've worked with residents and, you know, having gone through myself 20, 25 years ago, um, when I was a resident, the, the way that the curriculum was set up was there were periods of time where you could actually spend in private practices. It wasn't right. all hospital-based. And what many people don't realize is that residency programs are sponsored uh, by Medicare. And yep. um, they, you know, so it, they're feeding into the, the hospital system. Granted, the hospital is where you're going to get all the trauma and a lot of the, 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 the experience, but the majority of people receive their care outpatient. 
And as one of the questions I always ask my small groups together is, okay, so what are you going to do? I'll ask my, my graduating residents, okay, what are you going to do afterwards? And they'll say, I think I'm going to join this group here. I might open up, I'll just hang my shingle because that was a big thing. Hang your shingle and then open up your practice. That has become less and less and less. And there are some really great studies by Merritt Hawkins, who came out uh, every year with the the final year residents survey. Um, and almost 90 percent of residents have been approached by a hospital or corporate entity to get um, to get a, an employment job. And they're not looking at they weren't even introduced to the idea of um outpatient and private practice. The programs themselves are phenomenal as far as clinical skills that you're learning, all the new technologies, and like in my case, all the new surgical techniques um, and, and, and ways of treating all the new pharmaceuticals. Uh, but with, and they're not thinking about price tags when they're in residency right. about that, um, but they never get exposed to going out and actually talking to your patient one-on-one, -on -one, talking to the family members, running an office, because they don't have time anymore to go out unless they make it on their own. Um, what's great these days, a lot of DPC doctors and have, and direct, especially doctors, we invite residents to come into our offices um, to watch how it's done like that. It's hard I, I, I really, a big kudos to the residents that are right now because they're in that transition phase. It's not part of the program. They have to find it themselves and get out to find it, but we're out here. And so I, I do want to make make point that, that that is a big shift. And I think we're beginning to get that change. I think some of the, the curriculums are going to change with regards to that. I hope, you know, uh, that's a big, that, that needs to change. Well, and one thing I will say is that the you see it now and there are residents that are like, you know what, I am not going to go in a traditional setting. They've seen a setting like yours and they're like, this is what I want to do. This is, you know, um, gives me what I really want instead of having an insurance company control me. And that is cool to see medical students and residents that, that want to go into private practice again and do it outside of the traditional system. Cause that's Absolutely. what's going to be the, yeah, it's just, it, that, that to me is. Don't say traditional. <laughs> mm. Yeah. No, that, it's a short term that we've been in the insurance cycle. So right. exactly. I, I say traditional. <laughs> oh. Jen, always me no, <laughs> no. You know, and look at what you, we've been with the FMMA for, for years and it looked back to some of the earlier conferences. What was beautiful this last time, 80 students, I know, right. came, you know what I mean? And I'm yeah. seeing that at other, you know, other smaller venues and smaller conferences, we're getting students interested in this and it's, it's really cool. And well, so I think that comes directly from physicians like yourself or even Kathleen Brown. I mean, all these, all these people that have practiced that are willing to give their time to these young students and say, hey, we did it. And, and there's an alternate way that is very fulfilling because, you know, if you think about it, Sean and I have talked about this before. You couldn't pay me enough to go back in that setting. There's not okay. a dollar amount that I could accept mm -hmm. for being able to reflect even on my own self in the mirror and say, did I do what I set up to do? I mean, am I being true to myself mm -hmm. and to that patient? And am I causing harm or am I helping heal? I mean, right. you couldn't put a dollar amount on that. So I think that the traction of seeing faces like yourself or other, even specialty, because Kathleen is a specialist. Right. Um, well, Jack, her husband, her husband right. is, is leading Benjamin Rush. The Benjamin right, right, right. now, which I highly recommend every medical school get a chapter set up because this is how it's it's beautiful. It's grassroots and it's it's right. coming back. Yeah. So. so Grace, as we wind this podcast up, um, tell us what you have a passion for. Just making leaving the place better for my kids. I love <laughs> you it. Know, That's it's awesome. like golden rule, you know. Yeah. And so you know, I, I, I've been blessed. My parents I, I always attribute it to them. And I think that's just the culture that I grow up in. And I think that's just a very, very 
you have to be grateful for what you've been blessed with and, and pass it on and pay it forward. Um, I watched my parents practice uh, in medicine. Um, I started that way. I am finishing that way also. I've still got, my kids are in college, so I have to work still. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, as I get older and, 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 and use the system more, I want this for myself. And if we don't right. have physician autonomy, I mean, we watched the whole, we watched the whole thing happen with COVID, how everybody started getting funneled into groupthink. Physician autonomy gives you that second opinion. Right. You need those independent thinkers out there because that is how we will get ahead um, just overall in, 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 in any of the technology and the way that we're treating. So That's awesome. So if anybody has any questions and wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, I'm pretty easy to find online. Um, Dr. Grace, ugh. Dr. Grace DPM. Dr. Grace DPM online. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, I hang out at LinkedIn and Instagram mostly. And okay. Okay. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, uh, I I see your Facebook po- or your um, your social media posts. So I appreciate what you do and you've helped us realize our goal of this podcast, which is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. So I appreciate you. Thanks for doing what you're doing. Thanks to you guys also, because what you've been doing, I, I love your show um, and, and the way that you, you, you bring about just, just a, a, an easy way of, of putting it, putting it together. Um, so I appreciate what y'all are doing too. Well, thank you so much. And get, get this book too. Exactly. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's on Amazon. Uh, so you've been listening to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you for tuning in today. Tune into our regular, our midweek podcast Thursday, eight AM to nine AM Pacific Standard Time. Thank you for listening today.